Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Joel Rumbolo. Is that the correct pronunciation, Rumbolo? Well, the real Italian way is Rumbolo. Oh, forget it. <laughs> well, I can do that. <laughs> Rumbolo, all right. Rumbolo. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, Joel lives in northwestern New Jersey, and we'll let him fill a little bit of his bio info in. But um, I, there was sort of an amusing thing which happened this week. I was... I got some feedback from a friend who's kind of a regular follower of the show, and he said, hey, what's going on? He said, you started this out as being interviews with ordinary awakened people, but lately you've been interviewing all these people that write books and have students and have websites and, and all that stuff, and so what happened to the ordinary bit? So I think we have to first ascertain that you are ordinary before we can proceed, all right? It's so, ordinary. <laughs> so, so you love your mother, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. You like yeah. apple pie? Very much so. Good. But you I like... prefer cherry. Okay, you prefer cherry. That would be probably my preference. And you, and you like baseball, right? Yankees. Yankees, all the way. And uh, your body probably performs all the same ordinary functions that the rest of our bodies do, right? Absolutely. All right. And I have a website, and I'm not promoting anything. <laughs> Good. So you, <laughs> you pass. There you go. Well, I have to agree with your uh, with your friend. Uh, I enjoy more when it's just ordinary people because it's uh, you know they can talk about the practical things and not get into uh, a philosophical discussion. Yeah, and that's I, what's important. In fact, sometimes the teachers, not always, but sometimes the teachers are actually people who are like professional teachers are reluctant to talk about themselves or their own experience. They just want to <laughs> give out a teaching. And um, I, what I try to do, and I, I'll, I'll surely be interviewing more, is just say, well, okay, well, how did you come up with this idea, you know, from your own experience? If you're, if you're giving out a philosophical or spiritual principle, how does that mm -hmm. relate to your experience such that you can be speaking that with authority, you know? Um, exactly. And But, you know, people who aren't in the habit of teaching tend to do that anyway because that's all they really have to talk about, although we can all go off on flights of fancy, but... Uh, you know, there's more of yeah. a tendency to speak from your direct experience. Exactly, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. that's true. <laughs> okay, so. so you know how these interviews go. We usually kind of trace the history of a, a person's uh, spiritual journey in this life and, you know, what first inspired them to start thinking or talking about this kind of stuff and, and sure. you know, how did it go? Well, it's an interesting thing, you know, this week now I've been trying to, uh, well, it's only, I think we talked Monday, so it's very hard for me to, I'm, I won't be able to get a direct, perfect timeline anymore because I just can't do it. That's right. I'm, I'm 64 and that's part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> but um, to, to start it out, I, I guess I got to say, when I was a child, you know, I had a fleeting glimpse, you know, the <laughs> the, uh, the uh, Led Zeppelin song. But uh, no, um, every night when I would go to sleep, I would sleep in this bliss. Ah. Have this very expanded uh, awareness. And at the time, I thought this was normal. Huh. So as a child, like as four, a child. four or five, six years old, you know, like that? As long as I can remember. Uh -huh. uh, and I guess as I became an adult, that kind of went away mm. because you, know, you get married, you have family, stuff like that. Were you? Uh, uh, would, would it happen to you just as you were drifting off, or would you actually somehow be experiencing bliss throughout the night? I can't remember if it was bliss throughout the night, but I know as I what I would do is just I'd lay down, I'd close my eyes, and I'd become very expanded uh -huh. and, uh, and blissful. Nice. And it was a you know very pleasant experience. Um, so that was the beginning of it, and I had no idea about spirituality or anything like right. that. Right. Um, and as I said, uh, you know, you get into life, you just do what's going on. And um, I went in the army in 1969, mm -hmm. and I was trained as a combat photographer, which I never got to do any of that you know, combat photography, but I was stationed at NORAD. Where? NORAD in Colorado Springs. All right. The, the war room in Cheyenne right. Mountain. Right. And I was basically, basically a PR photographer. I got to uh, photograph many, many celebrities. Uh -huh. And one celebrity that I got to photograph was uh, General Westmoreland. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happened only in the waking state. Uh 
Huh. I just went into this, you know, the silence witnessing. Now I can talk about it in those terms. Yeah. At that time, it was just, oh, wow, you know. And uh, You mean in the process of photographing General Westmoreland exactly. that happened yeah. to you? Huh. Yeah. Just, we were, just out of the blue, unexpectedly, it just happened. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, you know, we had I had two four-star generals in front of me, so maybe <laughs> it yeah. was one of those things where, you know, when you have an accident, everything slows down. It was probably the same... Huh. Uh, the same kind of thing going on in my nervous system. And I remember that very vividly, and all the photographs came out perfectly, and, you know, the it just went on by itself for a few minutes and then came back uh, to normal experience. So uh, when, I, uh, when I left the Army, um, I opened a photography studio. Mm. And uh, for the first time, now, now I'm 23 years old, I had never done any drugs before and didn't really drink a lot of alcohol or anything, yeah. got into uh, marijuana. Mm -hmm. And I think I stayed stoned for a whole year. Not from one but, joint, but from smoking every day, you mean? Yeah, well, every day, right. every chance I had. And uh, I finally got got the feeling this, this wasn't where I wanted to be, and, you know. And uh, Did you have any noteworthy experiences on marijuana? <laughs> not not really. <laughs> yeah. Like it didn't it didn't uh, oh it, it expanded. It didn't, did, yeah. it, did it induce that expansion experience or anything? Exactly. I mean, sure, uh -huh. you feel that. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're blissful. Uh, but there's so many side effects. I mean, you're right. and stuff like that. So yeah, anyway, yeah. eating a lot of donuts. So, <laughs> so I decided that wasn't a good idea, mm -hmm. and um, I decided. I was going to try yoga, so I bought this little book on Hatha Yoga, mm -hmm. and it's a little skinny Indian guy is doing all these poses and stuff, which at the time um, I was able to do, more or less. I mean, it weren't, wasn't perfect. And uh, in the back of the book was a few suggestions about meditation. Mm -hmm. One was staring at a candle, uh, and I found that I was very successful with that. I could stare at a candle and immediately step back into... A witnessing mode. Yeah. Um, if I lie down after some of the asanas, I found that I would slip back into that. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, this is better than marijuana. Maybe I'm going <laughs> to go yeah. along with this. <laughs> and um, the funny thing was, I decided to go to a woman that was teaching at a local uh, high school. I walked in, I got my big stash, I got my granny glasses, you know, I'm I'm a professional photographer. She's teaching what? It's yoga? Yoga, yeah. Hatha uh -huh. yoga. Uh -huh. And she looks at me and immediately says, yoga is not for drug addicts. Ha! I mean, she said this. This was, this was perfect because, all right, I got up, I walked out, and on the door of the uh, high school, as I'm walking out, is a picture of Maharishi and saying, introductory lecture tomorrow. Mm. So I said to my wife, I said, let's... Let's go to this. And that was the start of the spiritual path for me. Um, I guess I started the next week. I had, well, I think, I forget how many days you weren't supposed to smoke or anything, you know. Uh, 14. So, 14. Yeah. No, I waited. I, I did it correctly. So uh, started in New Jersey with a very nice teacher, Jim Hanlon. And uh, this was 1972 in May. It was a spectacular experience. Tell me, I, about, tell me about it. Okay. Um, what happened was, uh, after the initial uh, uh, initiation, sitting down, and he's, he's, uh, you, you go through that first period, and then the going out, you know, you're going to meditate for a certain amount of time. Let me, let me just clarify that. So you, when you learn TM, there's an initiation ceremony, and... During that ceremony, you do several little brief meditations, and then once the teacher feels that you sort of have the hang of it, you go in the next room and meditate on your own for a longer period. So that's what you did, yeah. Right, exactly. Well, I didn't have to go to the next room. He left the room. Uh -huh. As soon as he left the room, I continued doing the process, and it, what happened was all the breath left my body. I thought it was sucked out. But after, after thinking about it, I realized it just was so relaxed. My body just went into this total relaxation since, you know, the peripheral muscles aren't expanding the lungs. The air just leaves. And um, the next thing I know was a knock on the door, which was 20 minutes or 15 minutes. I don't remember. Uh, 
And it was just so beautiful. I came downstairs, and I'm looking at him, and, and he gives me the questionnaire, and there's no place to put this stuff. <laughs> and I didn't know what to say, and I kind of left it that way. Uh, so I went through the three-day checking and all that, but I knew from then on I was going to be dedicated to this. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I became a teacher within six, seven months. Well, how did you feel after that first meditation? You just felt really smooth and, and relaxed? And smooth, very relaxed. Um, I wasn't, I didn't feel expanded, but what I did notice, and this is, this gets back to that idea of practicality, mm -hmm. was there were so many little things that would bother me that were totally gone. Yeah. I and mean, the attitude changed, just this whole, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd say stuff to my wife and, or she says something to me and ah, it doesn't matter. And we said that, we call each other on the phone and, this doesn't matter anymore. Huh. All these different things just kind of dissolve. So, I mean, what, what more do you want? I mean, you're doing this for your, for your life. Right. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, about six months later, maybe seven, eight months, I forget what it, what it took, but I wound up in uh, Vitel, France, on a teacher training course, and uh, came back and worked in... Um, in New Jersey at the Edison Center until, mm -hmm. oh, I guess, around 1976 or so. Right. I can't remember. I, in fact, I had a car accident in Edison in 1976. I was there for the summer with a bunch of guys, including the famous Johnny Gray. And uh -huh. we, we were uh, teaching, you know, in the state, and uh, because there was this court case that was going on, which, you know, challenging the, the teaching of TM in the schools. And uh, I had an appointment with the, the mayor of New Brunswick. And I was, I was racing along, trying to get to this appointment. And I had like my breakfast on, the, on this passenger seat, which was like yogurt and fruit and all this stuff, and cottage cheese or something. And, uh, and I was going right past the Edison post office when this guy in a great big, I was in a little Subaru compact, and this guy in a great big boat of a car pulled directly in front of me, and as soon as he saw me coming, he slammed on his brakes and sat there. <laughs> and I was going a little bit fast, and I just broadsided him. The car was totaled, and, uh, and the, the, my breakfast flew all over the dashboard. And I ended up, uh, but it was early in the morning. I, I missed that appointment, but I, I had like appointments scheduled until 11 o'clock at night. And it was like a radio interview, the last thing at 11 o'clock at night. And I just went through the whole day continuing to do this stuff, even though I was limping because my <laughs> I hurt my foot. I bent the brake pedal totally up to the floor. Anyway, that was my Edison experience, and I'll get back to you now. <laughs> well, yeah, it was a great center, but uh, that was towards the end of uh, the Merv wave. You know, we had opened uh, two centers, actually, and we were thinking about a third. Let me well, tell you what, tell them what the Merv wave was. Uh, the Merv wave was this thing where M Marshy Mahesh Yogi went on the Merv Griffin show three times, actually, and each time he did, there was a huge upsurge in, in interest in, in TM, and people were lined up around the block, and then it would taper off again. So, and the, and the TM movement would open all these centers, and then when it tapered off, they couldn't afford to keep them open. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what happened, exactly. So, um, it was time for me to get a job because we were making $25 a month at the time, right. <laughs> and it was a little rough, and I had a baby on the way. Yeah. So, um, I started to work, and a friend of mine in California, called and he said, look, the icing on the cake is coming up. you got to go to the six-month course. <laughs> and I said, ah, oh, I don't know. And he said, he said, well, you, how's your ATR credits? And that was, those were credits we would get uh, from the movement, as you know, uh, to, to go to Europe or to be with Maharishi for a while. Yeah, let me just explain that. I'm just trying to fill in the gaps for people who don't do, sure. know anything about TM. There, if you taught a certain number of people, every, you would get credits, which would, in, which would accumulate in a fund, and it would pay for your airfare and your course fee to go over to Europe for these courses with Maharishi. So, that's, so you, you're, you're talking about your – and it was ATR stood for Advanced Training Resources or something like that. Exactly, yeah. All right. Go ahead. Luckily, I had enough ATR, so the whole course was free. All I had to do was pay the uh, the airfare. Mm -hmm. So I went, and it was spectacular. I guess within the second week, I had ordered a set of Rudrosh beads from uh, <laughs> Press Jewel, and they finally came, and I opened the box, and immediately I started witnessing again. Huh. And it was really heavy, and it stayed that way through the whole course. And, and uh, why don't you define witnessing? What happens is you step back, um, there's, there's a, a shift in perception or a shift in 
I guess the best way to say it is a shift in your point of view. Mm -hmm. So you um, you feel there's an outside and there's an inside, and the inside is still and quiet, and the outside is still this jumble of things going on. Mm -hmm. And you are just watching. You, you step back from your normal position, your normal perception, and you're just kind of watching what's going on. Right. And it's not a volitional stepping back. It's not, it's not like you're saying to yourself, okay, I'm going to step back now and watch. More like there's a shift, and you, rather than identifying with the little me, which is running around doing things, you, you identify, there's a greater identification with that silence, right? Is that correct to say? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're very aware of the stillness and the silence within. Uh, at that stage, though, you're not, I, I feel, I wasn't really identified with it. Okay. There was still a me out there, but I was watching the me uh -huh. go on. So there was doing. a me someplace, and the me was aware of this little, of, of Joel doing his thing, and the me was also aware of this silence, but then there was also a me. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so after the course, we, we, we came back, I think, right before uh, Thanksgiving. That was the year that uh, Elvis died, and uh, the Yankees swept the Dodgers in four games. It was <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I came back, and this lasted for a good three years. The witnessing. The witnessing. Yeah. Uh, in fact, and I can't remember the timeline, but there was a call from the movement, and they basically said, we want you to come up to Livingston Manor, and tell us what's going on with you. You know, you're not active in the movement anymore. What's going on? Oh, really? You specifically, or were they calling all the teachers who weren't active? Yeah, there was about maybe 30, 40 guys up there mm -hmm. uh, at that time. And, and, uh, and let me also ask you, this witnessing that was going on for three years, was uh, it 24-7 or even like during sleep, or did it sort of fade in and out? According to it, wasn't, it wasn't during sleep. Okay. Like it's now. Um, it wasn't during sleep, and there was still a me, there was still an ego, and I was very attached to thoughts, even though I'm watching these thoughts. It's a whole different quality than what's going on right now. Okay, we'll get to what's going on now. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So anyway, uh, yeah, I met one-to-one -one with this fella, and he said to me, well, well, you know, how come you're not um, active anymore? And I said, well, I have a child. I really have to make a living. You know, um, I do teach once in a while if people ask, which I did. Um, but, uh, and I said to him, you know, I feel so fulfilled right now. I really don't need a residence course. I really feel complete, mm -hmm. uh, which was wrong. <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> complete at all. <laughs> but it was a very nice three years. Yeah. And I went through a period of, um, I don't know exactly how long it was. As I said, I lost the timeline. But I'd say it was anywhere from eight to 12 years where I would have to actually notice, I would have to remember the witnessing. It wasn't there all the time, 24-7 or anything now. Otherwise, you were just tied up in your life, doing your thing, and, and forgot, right. yeah, forgot all and about it. Totally forgot about it. And the way I would... I you were still would, meditating, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. No, I was, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe I'd look at my hands, and all of a sudden I'd say, you know, I'd notice that, I'm witnessing my movements, whatever whatever it took, it would come back now and then, and I would have to actively uh, initiate that that looking, that, that noticing. Uh-huh. Okay. So around 1999, the same friend that talked me into going to, um, going to the uh, six-month course gives me a call, and he says, um, I want you to look at this website. Who is this guy? Is this somebody I know, this friend that keeps telling you these things? I don't know. Do you know Ben Ingram? Yeah. He was in, yeah. Uh, he was in the Jersey area, wasn't he, for a while? Absolutely. He taught at our center. At yeah. The, at the center. Yeah. Ben lives in California now. He's working for Corbell as a um, financial advisor. But anyway. Okay. Um, so he, he, he said, uh, check out the Douglas Harding hmm. website. And he said something about headless. Right. Now, about three weeks before Ben contacted me, I started to get back into this witnessing. It was just spontaneous, and it mm -hmm. was heavier and heavier. I just noticed that it was there more and more. Yeah. 
Um, anyway, I recognized Headless right away. I mean, just the word uh, was enough to bring on that experience again. Mm. So I contacted Ben. He said, well, you know, you really, you know, you've been doing TM for all these years and you really should check out some Advaita Vedanta teachers. Mm -hmm. And I was very, very hesitant because I was so dedicated to TM and Maharishi and the whole, you know, I don't need anything else. Right. TM going to do it. And um, so I went on, uh, on the website and the next teacher was coming through was this young Polish woman. Her name is Neelam. Uh -huh. Went to New York City. What year is and, this now you're talking about? I'm sorry? What, what year are you talking about now? Around 1999 or oh. 2000. Okay, yeah. good. Yep. Exactly. Um, I brought another friend with me, another TM teacher from the Edison Center, and we mm -hmm. sat down and immediately went into this really, really deep silence. She came out of the bedroom, sat down in front of us, as you know, teachers do, and we kind of locked eyes. And I, there was nothing going on with me. I mean, the world kind of dropped away. I could still see, but I was just in this total silence. And she's looking at me, and she's kind of nodding her head. Uh -huh. I'm figuring, well, maybe she knows what's going on, you know. So she, first thing she does is, is there any questions? Mm -hmm. And <laughs> she's staring at me. She uh -huh. isn't going to take a question from anybody else. She's staring at me. And I said, uh, after a long period, because I didn't want to ask, and I stood up and I said, there's so much silence right now, but I'd like to know if the mind is ever going to come back again. Mm -hmm. And she started to giggle. <laughs> and she says, well, it really depends. I mean, she didn't give me an answer. Right. And uh, somehow I had the concept that if I was enlightened, I was never going to think again. Hmm. You know, I was gonna, just going to be in silence all the time. Without and thoughts. Without thoughts. Where'd you without, get that idea? Mar Margie never said that. No, he certainly didn't. No. And, uh, you know. <laughs> Just some idea you'd gotten onto. Some idea I had gotten. Uh, anyway, I think it was from Papaji, actually. You know, he uh, already said there's this silence. You Just stop thinking, stop thinking. Yeah. Whatever. It was a mistake. <laughs> so, <laughs> which, you know, probably too anyway, but... Uh, it was beautiful. I hung out with Neil for a couple of years, and I finally decided that all I'm doing is uh, trading Maharishi's concepts and other concepts for Neil's concepts. And I mm -hmm. said, it's time to just drop all the teachers and see what's going on with me. Right. And during this time, Ben and I were writing emails, a lot of emails each day. We He would read something, I would read something, he'd experience something, I'd experience something. So we were kind of... Uh, talking about it a lot, and we had this beautiful two-year conversation just uh, about our experiences. And um, eventually what happened was uh, all this became very permanent. And one day, this heavy silence is with me, but the mind is still rolling along. I mean, really heavy, and it's... What, what happens, I think, is... The mind wants to own this experience. And so you, you're experiencing the silence and the stillness and the beautiful peace, but the mind is still trying to grasp and grip. And it can become uncomfortable. I was staring at a tree out in the backyard, and all of a sudden I heard this voice say, you're never going to understand this. Let it go. Mm -hmm. And when I did, the mind became quite quiet. Not that thinking has stopped, but there was another shift mm. there at that time. And that shift was important. That, that was the shift from witnessing to actually realizing that I am the stillness and silence. Huh. And at that moment, there was also the recognition that there was the personal part of me had faded away. When I say personal, it's words that really don't touch the experience, but the feeling of, of me, and I think it's because my mind, you know, the thinking where, where I exist, the small I exists in the thinking, uh, just decided it wasn't going to do it anymore. And that's when everything became more or less 24-7. Mm -hmm.
and that I can't remember exactly what year it is. Maybe 2002. I don't know exactly. Yeah. And now, the changes that happen aren't on that side of the equation. The changes are in the perception and how this mind body actually reacts to life mm -hmm. and how it, you know, goes through life and how life flows through what I am now, this, you know, this, uh, non-person entity, whatever you want to call it. Uh, let's let's I, step I, back a little bit now, because, and let's kind of explore this in greater detail. So um, you had this shift that when you were looking at the tree, mm -hmm. and uh, the you say that the, the, the mind, everything became much more silent than it already had been, and, and you finally sort of uh, shifted to a, a, a really primary identification with that silence or that vastness or that emptiness as being what you are rather than some individual and and there was no sort of individual little guy looking at that silence and looking at your individuality and sort of it was in other words you really had had made gone to the other pole of the spectrum and and you were you were establishing that silence as the self as wh what you are exactly. and um, and yet to the observer you would still appear to be who the same person you always had been. There, it, it would look as though there were a person there who likes baseball and who's a photographer and who has kids and who does this and who does that. Um, and that's, I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a thing that comes up often and it's very puzzling for people because, first of all, it's a little bit disturbing or frightening for people because they think, well, I don't want to just become a nobody. I don't want to lose myself or... or you know, uh, lose what makes me special or what, you know, I don't want to have my personality sucked out by cosmic vampires or anything. Um, and uh, so there's yeah. that. There's a sort of a concern about it. And there's also a perplexity about it because it, for all appearances, you are a person. You do have likes and dislikes and stuff. There, there does seem to be somebody home. So perhaps you could elaborate on, on those, those thoughts. Sure. Well, you know, it, it's a real paradox, and unless you you have the, and it's not even an experience, unless that shift occurs, you really, really can't understand it because you're trying to understand it with the mind. Mm -hmm. It's just so self-evident once that, that shift occurs that this is the way it is, and this is who I am. I mean, and even those words, I am, it doesn't work. Right. Um, Again, for me, the beauty part of this whole thing, and one other statement I'd like to make, is that this is not what I expected. <laughs> it has, it's, it's just not what I expected. It ha it's, yeah. In other words, your concepts, either through Marshi or through Neelam, were just uh, inadequate to, they didn't quite grasp what it ended up actually being. Exactly. Right. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, and again, that was the point where uh, I didn't have that, that deeper understanding, that deeper uh, experience, that, that deeper shift, if you want to call it. Um, the mind was still going on, and there was a person watching the mind, and the person, you know, worshiping this beautiful silence and stillness. And until that changed, until that became. Uh, I am that silence, that silence and stillness. I couldn't understand it. Hmm. I mean, you can read, you can do all these things. It, it just doesn't matter. It's it's just a matter of when that shift happens. Yeah. So when you and, uh, had that experience with the, you know looking at the tree and that shift happened, I mean, what did you do right then? Did you come back in the house and say, "Holy crap, honey, I just got enlightened," or, or <laughs> what? <laughs> well, I did write Benny. I said I, there's a there's a new shift that just happened, but mm -hmm. um, no, I didn't. I, you, you know, I love uh, Jim Flanagan and his uh, his comments. You know, uh, before it's uh, chopping wood and carrying water, and afterwards it's chopping wood and carrying water. <laughs> yeah, he, he didn't make that up, by the way. <laughs> oh, I know, I know, yeah. that's a bad thing, but still, <laughs> yeah. it's just. Uh, it, it, it's it's the way it is, mm -hmm. but you don't you're not hooked anymore. Mm -hmm. You're not hooked into uh, and to say you don't believe thoughts or you, you. What I find, and I think the best way to describe it is there is a peace. Mm 
mm. that is undescribable. Mm-hmm. And that's it all understanding. Yeah, that, yeah. There's no way to explain it. Right. Um, and it, you know, Marish used to say uh, it's the feeling that mother is at home. I mean, you're just um, there's this peace. So if an incident happens, whether you uh, you know you feel a little angry or you're surprised about something or whatever it might be, that hook of identity isn't there anymore. All right. So let's let's say you have a fender bender. You know, somebody you're sit, sitting in a light, somebody bangs into you and 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 dents your fender and. You get out, and he's all flustered. And so, you know, how would that experience be for you? Well, I haven't had one in a while, but I, I'll tell you, just a couple of days ago, somebody turned right in front of me, uh-huh. and there was this, you know, this a shock of that happening. But what happens is it, it dissipates immediately. Um, you know, it, like a lion on water. Or a line like a line of water, yeah. Like yeah. a line of water. It's there for a second, you know, mm-hmm. as you're following the finger because there's a wake, but mm-hmm. it just folds into itself. Yeah. Uh, and that's the way all experience is, you know, whether it's thoughts, whether it's emotions, whether it's what you see. I mean, everything is changing constantly. Mm-hmm. There's no, there's nothing out here that you can grab onto and say, it's going to be this way in five minutes. You just don't know. Right. And after you live with this for a while, which you kind of um, realize, and I hate to say this because, but it's, it's all going on by itself. Mm-hmm. It's just going on by itself. And in a way, what I've learned or what this experience does, it allows you to accept that. Totally accept it. So when you say it's going on by itself, does that mean that you feel that there really is no sort of individual will? There's just sort of this whole universe is just rolling along and, and you're a detached witness to it? Well, I'm not a detached witness. I've embraced, I mean, you embrace life. Mm-hmm. Life is, you're hugging it. Mm-hmm. It's just so wondrous and beautiful. Uh, every experience, you know, food, uh, the things you see, music, whatever. But you're just, and again, I'll use the word, you're just not hooked by it. Um, I don't know how to make a better... Uh, that's a good, uh, good phrase. And, and, and of course, you know, that doesn't mean you don't remember things. The fact that things aren't leaving an impression doesn't mean you don't remember them. You could probably tell me who won the World Series last year or whatever. Uh, but it, <laughs> was it the Yankees? I don't know. Oh, yeah, it was the Yankees. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't followed them too closely since uh, since Whitey Ford was the pitcher and Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris and that whole lineup in '61. Um, but anyway, uh, so you you mentioned 24/7, okay, with this experience. So obviously we spend eight hours a night sleeping. What is your experience during sleep now? Has it gotten back to what it was when you were a child, or is it different, or what? When I lay down and close my eyes. Well, right now, it doesn't matter whether my eyes are closed, open, whether I'm sitting. Um, you know, I don't use the mantra anymore. Sometimes it shows up, sometimes it doesn't. I'm not using anything. I sit, close my eyes, and, you know, it just rolls. Yeah. It just rolls, yeah. meaning you're just in a in a state of unboundedness, just enjoying exactly. that. Yeah. Enjoying that. Whatever <laughs> floats through doesn't. It just. Bo- body's getting some rest. Mm hmm. That's what's great about it. So anyway, so sleep, you close your eyes, it's all expanded, you float off, uh, a dream goes through. Sometimes um, I'll have, it's almost like a movie, but it's very, very vivid. It's it's as vivid as right now, you know, life, uh, waking state. That'll happen. I wake up in the morning, there's that first impulse of, of um, you know, feeling the body again, having the thought come through. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you don't know where you are, sometimes you do, sometimes whatever, but there's a continuation through that whole night of, you know, the, 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 the awareness is aware, even when there is nothing there. 
you know, nothing to experience, nothing to be aware of. There's still what we used to call pure awareness. Okay. And that, so this is a, a something that you know people in various spiritual traditions have spoken of. Uh, I think in the Song of Solomon in the Bible it says, "I sleep though my heart waketh," and um, the in the TM movement it's called witnessing sleep, and it's said to be a sign of what Marshy called cosmic consciousness. And the um, so let's talk about that just for a minute before we go on to the next thing, which. You, you you say, I mean, sometimes people feel like when they're witnessing sleep, this is going to mean, this is one of these conceptions people have before they actually experience it, this is going to mean that they're going to necessarily, so that even though they're sleeping, they're going to be aware of what's going on in the room, or they're going to be aware of some kind of external thing through their senses. But you don't mean that, do you? No. No, I don't mean that at all. Um, you do, I find there's a period of nothing. Mm-hmm. No, no sense perception, uh, you know, except the fact that you know that you still know. All right, now let me probe that a little bit. Somebody might say, well, how do you know it? Because if there's no sense perception, how do you experience it? It must, there must be some sense experiencing this, this awareness or this knowingness. I have no idea. I ha I can't really explain it, Rick. Um, I'm just kind of drawing it out of you a little bit, but I mean, yeah, obviously, it's not something which has a smell, a taste, a touch, or a, a, an appearance or a sound. So, right. but yet you know it, and so would it be fair? And that would probably be true as much in the waking state as it is in the sleep state. So, would it be fair to say that it somehow knows itself through some mechanism which we might not be able to explain? Exactly right. Mm. Exactly right. Yeah, the you know the knowing. Is all th that is. I mean, you know that that knowing it knows itself. It's self-evident, but you can't put it into words. You can't grasp it with the mind. I mean, it's just it's when you look at it. If you look at it, it's empty. Yeah. And at the same time, it's filled with everything flowing through it. Mm -hmm. it uh, it's the container of everything, mm -hmm. and that's that's where the unity comes in. Mm. Because there's no inside or outside anymore. In fact, I don't even notice a movement of what I used to call awareness anymore. It's just all there. Yeah. So. Well, let's let's proceed toward that in increments. So um, you uh, so we've we've kind of covered the sleep thing. I think. Is there anything more you want to say about that? Yeah. It's, right. yeah. Do you sleep the same number of hours as you used to? No, much shorter. How, uh, like, like how long? Uh, maybe three, four hours. I'm awake again. I might get up and sit and meditate for a while. Uh, sometimes I don't go back to bed. Sometimes I'll just lay down. If I do lay down again, usually there's a lot of uh, uh, dreaming going on. Mm -hmm. And within another hour or so, I'm up. So, so you might, yeah, you might so go to bed at midnight and be up by four or five in the morning or something? Oh, yeah, always. Yeah. yeah. Huh. It, does, it really doesn't matter what time I go to bed, but four or five is... <laughs> when you get up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now you've said some intriguing things um, in the last you know, 20 minutes or so. You've, you've talked about the sumptuousness or the, the, the richness of your experience. Um, you've, I think you used the word exploring it or something. Um, we'll get to that. And, and you also just alluded to a sort of a unified state. So let's unfold that, taking as much time as you'd like to go into each sort of detail of it. Okay. Well, as far as what I would call a unified state mm -hmm. is um, once that final, and it's not final, but once that shift happens where you actually lose the idea of the separation, I mean, I, I actually see the silence. Uh, you know, I mean, I see the silence. In other words, when you look at your wall or something? Whatever I'm looking at, yeah. I you're see seeing silence in it. In it, you know, through it. Mm -hmm. And there was a period uh, right at, at, earlier in 1999, 2000, where I couldn't see, I didn't have that perception. Once I started seeing the silence, that's when the two things came together. So the inside became, there was no boundary between outside and inside anymore. Huh. So there was no 
no longer any sense that, okay, there's this silence which I am, and then there's this world out there which is kind of totally different from it. And, exactly. uh, yeah, okay. Exactly. Yeah. And it, so was the sense that the world is contained in the silence? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, my body, my mind, um, as the thoughts going through, whatever, it's all in that silence. And that silence actually, um, uh, well, I guess a word I could use is permeates everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I, I was listening to uh, Alan Watts the other day, and he was talking about how uh, the average person sees an object but doesn't see the space around the object. Mm -hmm. And for an architect or an artist, and maybe for a photographer, um, you know, you, when you look at something, you see the whole thing. And that space is included in that. Well, that's one way of looking at the world, but this is even more. But what it is is this this vastness and um, um, the vastness, the stillness, is what's perceived mm -hmm. through the eyes. Huh. Okay. Now, my friend actually sees everything with a, 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 a haze of light. Hmm. Who's that, Ben? Ben, yeah. I'll have to yeah. interview him too. <laughs> is, it, is, it a, is it a purple haze by any chance? <laughs> I don't think Ben well, maybe. <laughs> so, um, all right. So that's the unity part. Um, that way, nope. let's let's get that a little bit more. So you see the vastness. You said you see the silence. Now, of course, if, if you're looking at an apple, you're also seeing an apple. But, oh, absolutely. But and you're somehow not, seeing the you're seeing the. Would you say that the the vastness or the is is a subtle quality of the apple, or is it the ultimate level of the apple, or what, how, how would you? Yeah. I mean, because obviously, you know, people are gonna. It's the, one of those things. Another one of those things which if a person just hears it, it might sound weird. You know, they're gonna think, oh, what, what's this gonna mean? You know, am I gonna be able to hold down a job? Or, you know, am I gonna yes. you know am I gonna be able to relate to, relate to my kids or whatever? Um, exactly. Yeah. No, there's no problem. And, and things don't become ethereal. It's just that, and again, it's that deeper knowing without intellect, without uh, analyzation. It's the deeper knowing that I'm perceiving what's, you know, what used to be just inside is now everywhere. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And when I say I see it, it's, it's, um, it doesn't make things, well, you know, things are brighter, colors are brighter, uh, there's a wonderment about everything. I mean, you just, you know, it's just so beautiful. So anyway, uh, When you yeah. say you see it, now that just pertains to the to the eyesight, but how about, do you hear it, do you smell it, do you taste it, do you touch it? Not so much. Maybe, I can't really say honestly, that that's it. Yeah. And um, I know when I taste a piece of food, that sensation is flowing through that, but uh, you know, f through the stillness, because mm -hmm. that's the way everything is perceived now. I mean, the stillness is is first, and everything is in that. Mm -hmm. So, if I taste a piece of food, um, it's flowing through the stillness, but I can't. It's not the same perception or same quality that I'm talking about with my sight. Huh. Now, this could be because I was a photographer. Yeah, maybe you're a visual person, you know. Oh, very visual. Um, you know, when I plan something, I see it. Yeah. I don't think it. Mm -hmm. And it's always been that way. You right. know, I, I see the roads that I'm going to be traveling when I say I'm going to my son's house or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. so. um, and we beat that horse to death yet? Yeah, yeah, you can go on to the next horse. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> knowing that everything goes on by itself is what I'll try to explain now. Um, if you realize that you are uh, unconditional knowing, you're, that's what you are, unconditional knowing. There's no hook in any experience at all because I'm unconditional. I can experience anything unconditionally. What does experience, what does label and um, uh, quantify and qualify is the thinking mind. Mm -hmm. Now, part of this experience is there's no more 
uh, obsessive thinking, that's where the quietness comes in. The obsession, you know, thinking the same thoughts every day over so and over. So you never get a song stuck in your head and it goes over and over and over again? Just it gets a little different. Yeah. I wouldn't say that's obsession. I just have a jukebox there, and if I want to listen to Allman Brothers, it's there. Yeah, they are. Or, or a nice blues, you know, song or whatever. Right. <laughs> and I don't count that as, there's no suffering in it. There's no, you know, it's just. It's so you a, never have a thought that you think, God, I wish this would go away. I'm tired of thinking this thought. No, <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> of course, right. I used to. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, so the obsessive thinking, you know, constantly, and that's where the hook comes in. If you're not hooked into an experience, whatever happens can really, really be experienced as flowing through the stillness and silence, and that's where the peace and freedom comes in, mm -hmm. because whatever comes through is seen as arising and dissolving. So whatever it is, you know, whether it is something big like an accident or, you know, my daughter loses her job or something like that, eventually, it, it, I mean, it arose and eventually it's gone and it's over with. And I was, you never get hooked back into it with mm -hmm. thinking over and over again about my daughter lost her job, what are we going to do? You know, do I have to support her now? This kind of stuff. So, how about, uh, how about personal opinions? Do you um, feel that your opinions are about things are as strong as they ever were, or do you feel that you kind of have this a more of a broad-mindedness, and you can kind of sort of see everyone's perspective and how it's valid from its own little direction? Yeah, absolutely, because being unconditional, mm -hmm. you 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 can look at both ends of you know it's a paradox. You got the white and the black. And you can look at both of them and see value in both of them and realize that it's whatever's going to happen is going to happen. So, and for instance, like politics, you know, I mean, there's all these issues. First of all, there's the political parties, now there's the Tea Party, and then there's, you know, all kinds of issues that people get all hot and bothered about, like gun control and abortion and taxes and health care and all this stuff. I mean, when you do you watch the news and when you, when you listen or read about that stuff, do you do you find that you have a very definite sort of stance that, oh, I'm going to vote this way and I believe this about that issue and so on? Or do you, or, or is it more of a, a situation where there's both, where you have your opinion and at the same time you can kind of like accommodate other people's opinions even though they're completely different than yours? Yeah, I would say that, that describes it. Uh, uh -huh. I might have an opinion, um, but as you say, I can see the value of the other opinion and um, I don't have to. I don't have to argue with people. I don't have to jump up and down about my opinion anymore. Right. It's just you know, it, it's it's what I what's what's being thought. It might feel right, and that's why I'm leaning that way. But it just, I hate to say it doesn't matter. This isn't a strategy that that develops. This is a real. It's a symptom, not a cause. Exactly. Right. Yeah. In, other, in other words, it's just sort of the way you function. It's not something you're trying to do. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And 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 we're, we wouldn't suggest that a person can sort of arrive at this unified state by just sort of being kind of non-committal about things. <laughs> you know, just sort of having this go with the flow kind of grooviness about them or something. Right. It's all based on this on on that that shift that right. original. Awakening, or or that original realization that finally you you realize that uh, this is what you are. You're just unconditional. Yeah. I and think this is an important point because there's there's a lot of cart before the horseism going on in spiritual circles, and there always has, where where people sort of take descriptions of the goal and then try to turn that into a path, mm -hmm. and you know they'll. Um, you know, they'll just sort of adopt an attitude like, "Oh, I don't, I don't really care about anything," or, or, or they'll even adopt a concept like, you know, the world is an illusion and all is one. And okay, I'm done. I, I got that. You know, I, I must be enlightened now. I can, yeah. I can, I can start teaching, or I don't have to keep practicing, or, or whatever. Yeah. That that kind of stuff is un, is quite common. Yeah, yeah, um, it's true. And uh, you know, you, I, I, I went through some of that. You know, earlier in this in this whole uh, thing, I mean, you know, thirty eight, thirty nine years of uh, spiritual practice. It's kind of uh, 
everything went in the barrel. Everything. Yeah. 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 So uh, yeah, I had a spiritual ego ego at one time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Uh, yeah, and and, and um, this thing again about everything going on by itself. Um, so so when you see everything just arising and dissolving, I I really feel that's the key to this peaceful feeling. Everything is fine, and I can accept it. Whatever it is, accept it. So in other words. You you see everything arising and dissolving, mm -hmm. and that. Well, you better restate that. That's a little unclear. You, you see everything arising and dissolving, and that is the key to this peaceful feeling. It seems to me that you you just put the cart before the horse. In other words, that 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 silence got established, and because you're grounded in that, you every you see everything in a different way. Well, yes, yes, but but you see it flowing through me, right. Okay. So it's flowing through me. There's absolutely nothing initiated by a person, mm -hmm. a personal person. Yeah. I mean, it's just happening. It arises and dissolves, arises and dissolves. And, and um, so how can, you, how can you be attached, really, really attached to anything anymore? How can you really, really um, um, have an opinion? That that it's only this way, right? You know, what I'm saying is, once that shift happens, this is the way it is. This is, yeah. this is the change. Yeah, and it's the practicality. It's a, it's a subtle thing, actually. Uh, I think it's uh, because it's so easy to, to to sort of misunderstand what you're saying, uh, and I'm saying that just because I've misunderstood it, and I also see it being misunderstood. But you know, what what you're saying is that. You can correct me if I'm wrong. That um, you know, you just can't get locked. Oh God! There's a beautiful quote from the Bible. It goes um, for the. I've quoted this before on on some of these interviews. For the foxes have their holes and the birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Mm -hmm. And my interpretation of that is just what you said. You know that there's. Um, you know, you you don't. You can't be contained by any cubbyhole, by any nest, by any box, uh, by any concept. Uh, yeah. You can entertain concepts. You can favor one concept or over another, one opinion over another, but you're not defined by them. Yes, I would. I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's that's perfect. And when Another. you say things flowing through me, are you referring to your structure as a person, things flowing through that, or the bigger me you're referring to? Of course, the bigger me. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I, I had a root canal a while back, um, and with this experience or the way I am now, if I have pain, it's not lo it's not localized here. It's floating in that huh. space. So I didn't take any, uh, you know, anesthesia at all. Whoa! Uh, you can just be with it. It's just, huh. you know, it's pain. <laughs> yeah. It's, but it's not. It's not necessarily here. It's. It's there. It's, That's interesting. So, what did the dentist think of that? Think you're some kind of masochist or something? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I've been going to this guy for thirty years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he just, you know, you don't want any. I said, no, let's try this, and uh, it was fine. It wow. Was fine. Um, and would the same be true of pleasure? I mean, if you eat a delicious meal, is the sense? Is there a sense that um, it's just that that pleasure is out here someplace? <laughs> <laughs> Not with the meal, mm -hmm. but um, with uh, with my wife, in, mm -hmm. you know, intimately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's. Oof. <laughs> huh. so, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and is that better in some way? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Yeah, of course, of course. You know, we've been married uh, forty-four years, and oh. uh, yeah, it's this is probably the best time of our life. 
I mean, just everything about it. Right. She even said to me a couple of days ago, she said, I never thought I'd be so happy at this stage of my life. Hmm. That's cool. Has she had her own sort of spiritual awakening or, or what? Um, you know, she's meditated as long as I have. Uh, not so much that she'll she'll say I had an awakening, but I could see in her the way she operates. Yes. I think, um, I mean, she's the most laid back person I know. Hmm. So, uh, and if she's happy, I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. What do you you know? What do you want? <laughs> want right. to go poking the stick at something? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Now, you mentioned, uh, you know, that you see the silence in everything and uh, feel the silence in everything and so on. Um, do you, is there any subtle perception in terms of, like, you know, people talk in terms of, like, seeing auras or seeing angels or seeing some celestial level of life, any of that kind of stuff? Not at all. Uh -huh. I haven't seen an angel. I haven't uh, seen an aura. <laughs> no, nothing. nothing. Interesting. Yeah. I once heard... Uh, some people ask Maharishi about that, and uh, he said it's not really a criterion of a, a particular state of consciousness. It's more of a, a sort of a function of one's perceptual abilities or whatever, mm. which mm. which may or not may or not be tightly correlated with a particular state of consciousness. Right. Well, this brings up another point about um, if everything's going on by itself, then everything arises as necessary. Mm -hmm. So maybe I don't have to see an angel. Maybe yeah. whatever's going on here just doesn't, that's not where it's going to be. Right. And again, if you feel so fulfilled, I don't care. You know, right. if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah. You know. I mean, I listened to, uh, I think uh, Mary mentioned that she did. Was it Jim too? I can't remember. But a few people that you've interviewed have mentioned that. And it's, I mean, I don't disbelieve them. Sure. But, I mean, you know, when when you go to the six-month course, <laughs> you can't disbelieve anything anymore. <laughs> yeah, all kinds of stuff happens, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, what was I going to ask you? Yeah, go ahead if you have something more to say, because I forgot what I was going to ask you. So, so this really, there really is this feeling that uh, everything happens as necessary. Now, I don't know what the necessity is, mm -hmm. because I don't really know anything, you know, what I'm saying. I mean, I yeah. can't I can't say this is the way it is, or this is, you know, this. it's only this way. So being open-minded about this whole thing, so if, if I kind of feel that everything's going on as necessary, and everything sort of arises at the same time, you know, there's, there's the, the student, the teacher, the need to know, uh, the words that's going to be said, the book that you open, and you just hit the right page, and all of a sudden it just speaks to you perfectly. All that is um, is again this this whole uh, idea of it's all happening as necessary. Mm -hmm. And again, that's that it has to do with the peace. I so mean, throughout the day, every single moment, you just sort of feel like things are unfolding in a perfect kind of orderly mm -hmm. way, the way they're supposed to. Right, and that's not in a you know in an ethereal kind of. Uh, I mean, it's very concrete. It, right. It's but you know, I like. <laughs> well, how many times have I picked up Rumi and I'll open a, a page of poetry and then that just speaks to me so perfectly, or mm -hmm. or you pick up um, uh, Monsieur Gadatta's book and uh, you know I am that and. Mm -hmm. There's, it's just interview after, I mean, not interview, but question and answer, Q&A, Q&A, and you just happen to open up the right Q&A at that moment. It, whatever you... It's well, just, wouldn't it be that anything you opened it up to would seem right because there's just a lot of meaning in, in every Q&A and you, you would just sort of... Or, 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 or does it actually happen, and same with rumor, or does it actually happen that you open it to the one that actually pertains to something that's really going on in your life right then? That's exactly right. Mm. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And there's a prelude to it. There's a, there's a, uh, you know, like the night before, my daughter will ask me a question, or I'll have an insight, you know, just bubble up, and or I'll see something, or I'll there'll be a question about something, and if I open 
if I happen to open the book, it just speaks to me. Yeah. It speaks perfectly to me. What it does is it just, uh, uh, you know, clar it's, sometimes it's a clarification, but most of the time it's a confirmation mm -hmm. of what I already know. Uh, this and that, now that's with regard to sort of spiritual things, you know, books like Nisargadatta and so on. But how about like if you're... Oh, you're talking about the flow of... Well, yeah, everything. How, like how about you're, if you're walking around the grocery store, you know, and you're shopping and you're, you're looking for the soup or you're looking for the soap or the toilet yeah. paper or whatever. I mean, is there also, even in that circumstance, a sense of perfect flow that everything is just sort of happening exactly the way it's supposed to happen? Exactly, yeah. Uh, most definitely, you know, um, if, you, if you're looking for something, um, say, uh, to fix a vehicle, Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so you go to a, a, a shop, and you may be thinking about this. This is how I'm going to do it, and then all of a sudden, the correct answer will just come to you. Or, you know, um, I'll have a question about something, and I'll, I'll find it online very easily without, you know, just Google and boom, it's right there. Or the old thing about, especially in New York, trying to find a parking space, you turn a corner, and there you are. Huh. You don't have to try. You don't. You don't have to try. So, so, so things, just, things just come to you, and I, you know, yeah, correctly as necessary. Uh -huh. And and I have to say, if something doesn't come, that's fine too. And I, re you know, there's that kind of thing where you say, okay, all right. So say I was supposed to leave the house 15 minutes ago, but I got stuck doing something. Mm -hmm. I get in the car, I'm riding down the road, and here's a big accident. Now, 15 minutes earlier, I would have been <laughs> right there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you, know, you know this, and it, it it comes it comes so often that you just forget about it. Hmm. You don't constantly analyze this thing. It's just the way life is. Do you also have a thing like you'll be thinking about somebody, and then the phone will ring, and that person will call you up, and that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Huh. It's nice. I mean, everyone has experiences like this, but what you're saying is. As a result of this development that you've undergone, it's pretty much a constant quality of your life. It's the way life is. Yeah. It's the way it flows through. Uh -huh. That's great. I mean, that can help people to relate to this state because perhaps everyone's had a taste of inner silence and everyone's had a taste of sort of expansion and everyone's had a taste of these sort of coincidental experiences that seem more than coincidental. And so we know that such things are possible, and you're just an example of someone who has got, kind of gotten to the point where these things have become the permanent reality of life. Yes, I would, I would totally agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, and again, that, that allows the freedom and the peace to be in the mind Mm -hmm. The mind can now rest too. Okay, yeah. it, 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 I mean, you know, you're feeling this this bliss and love, and and stillness, and at the same time, the fulfillment, because it's happened so, because it it's rolling on by itself, the mind isn't hooked anymore. Right. I see it both ways. You know what I'm saying? You can you can you can say the cause is that shift. But you can also say, now the mind doesn't have to analyze or look or 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 uh, say this is because of the shift. Mm -hmm. The mind can just flow through. Right. The experience right. can just flow through. Now, uh, let me just open this and get a little fresh air. Now, open it all the way. What would you say? Uh, you know, you're saying everything goes on by itself, everything just flows naturally. Um, but there must be some kind of impetus to action. There must be something which gets you out of bed in the morning and, you know, puts your toast in the toaster. And, you know, there must be something that's, that's causing you to take your next breath, take your next step, you know, whatever it is that you do. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, most people perceive that something to be an individual who is pulling the, holding the strings and calling the shots and saying, okay, now I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Um, in your case, you don't feel there is such an individual. You feel everything is going on by itself, but there must be some motivating force. That's well, it's the impulse to action. And what you is know. that impulse? What is causing that impulse? 
it Sorry. arises. I have no idea what's causing it. Uh huh. I mean, it, it just arises. You, you, you're laying in bed. You're comfortable. You're awake. Thoughts are flowing through. And then all of a sudden, there's an impulse. I would like a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. And you get out of bed. But that's, you know, it wasn't, I don't feel that I, for me, thinking is a happening, not mm -hmm. an activity. Does that make any sense to you? Uh, you better clarify. Thinking is a happening. In other words, it's something that just happens automatically. Yeah, it's 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 arising and 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 dissolving by itself. So that's even the impulse to action. Now, sometimes I have an impulse to action, it arises, mm -hmm. and I act. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's an impulse and I don't act. Mm -hmm. It's it's going to be one way or the other. Whether the body mind is going to do it or or not do it, you know that 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 thing comes up. You don't have to make a decision. It's it's either going to happen or it's not going to happen. Huh. What I'm what I'm trying to do here um, is I have in mind actually I have in mind a particular individual who often watches these and says so far I haven't seen anything that makes me feel like the person you interviewed is any different than I am or uh, is has got anything that I would aspire to. And I'm, what I'm trying to... Um, you may be right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to pinpoint is um, you know, how this is different from what the average person experiences. Because the average person might say, hey, you know, I'm lying in bed in the morning and I want a cup of coffee, and so I get up and get one. What's, what's so different about the way Joel just described it? Can you, can, you say, like, can you go back like 20 years to when you were lying in bed and wanted a cup of coffee and, the way it, and try, to, try to contrast the way it worked for you then with the way it works for you now? Sure. Back then, there's a feeling that I am thinking this thought. I am willing myself to get out of the bed and go make a cup of coffee. I am willing myself to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and go to the same old shitty job that I hate. I am willing myself to do this, and I'm going to think about it all damn day, and I'm going to suffer over this. Mm -hmm. The difference is what I see is I am stillness, silence, the container of all experience, and part of that experience Part of what I is in me is this arising of either sometimes words, sometimes just a feeling, and that causes me to get up. There was no will in it. There was no individual will in it. Hmm. I don't feel I don't feel that I small I thinks anymore. What I see is that those energies arise, and it's. It, it, I, I can't say that you know what arises these energies is is um, creating this, but it's the impulse for the for activity, okay? Or it's the impulse to understand something. It's the impulse to. Um, you know, have an insight. Mm -hmm. Whether or not it's the correct insight, whether or not, it, I mean, all that just doesn't matter. Um, it's just going on by itself. Uh, all right. Let, let's, let's say this. Um, 20 years ago, there, there was a, a predominant sense that there was a, a localized individual I who was calling the shots. Um, sorry to be beating this to death, but it's, a, it's you know. Yeah. And but now there's no sense of a localized individual I, uh, and but nonetheless things continue to go on and happen. You you, you know your your body is doing stuff, uh, but there's if there's any motivator for that action, it's it's not so isolated as it once was. It's much more of a broad, vast, cosmic kind of thing that's that's motivating things. Well, that's a. I think that's. A, or am I putting words in your mouth? No, no, no. Part of it is I. 
um, I would say is correct, but it doesn't feel like this is this. I don't think about it as a cosmic flow or, co you know, or you just don't think about it as, that way. But there's this definite knowing that there's no I personal feeling in what arises, you know, in this space. Right. And do I'm you not, feel that, do you feel that there is still an individual I, but he just doesn't it just does it doesn't have thoughts and and all this stuff anymore, or there just isn't one? Not now there isn't one. Huh. No. That that ended. Um, there was a second um, kind of dropping away of of um, a feeling of the you small, mean after the tree experience. Yeah, right? after the tree later experience. on. Oh, tell yeah. tell us about that yeah. a little bit. Hmm. So there was still a feeling that somebody, somebody was uh, the knower. Mm -hmm. I didn't know who that somebody was, and it wasn't the original somebody that I thought I was twenty years ago. But okay. there still was the somebody. But there was still was the somebody, and that somebody also was gone. Um, at a certain point, that somebody else. At a certain will. point, yeah, 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 that happened a while back. I can't remember when. So, would you say? Uh, I heard a phrase today. Maybe you can agree with this. Um, I am nobody, and nobody's perfect. Therefore, I am perfect. <laughs> I'm just joking with you. No, I read it. Yeah, that's what the person said too. I'm just joking with you. No, I. Well, I'm not perfect. <laughs> Uh, again, I got to come back to this thing. Unless unless you've had that experience, it's very hard to uh, put into a concept that's going to be uh, yeah. understood. Yeah, uh, yeah, I I agree, and I understand that. Um, I'm just, but yeah, you know, I think dwelling on it like this, hammering away at it, I think helps in some way. It, it helps to clarify in some subtle way what's going on, what you're talking about, what the experience is. And perhaps so, to dispel some misconceptions. I wish, in a way, this were a live show, and we could sort of take questions from people as as we go along. You know, because people might think of questions that I'm not thinking of. And incidentally, uh, I should add that you know it is possible to submit questions. Um, you know, Joel's. I'll have this on Facebook, and I'll have it on BatGap.com, and, and there's a place there where you can type in questions, and Joel will answer them if you want to try to. <laughs> um, okay. Now, you know, one point that uh, one thought that occurred to me when a, a minute ago, which is kind of cool, is you were talking about how you know everything seems to be sort of orchestrated spontaneously, and like you might have trouble leaving the house, and you're 15 minutes late, but it turns out you missed a car accident because you're 15 minutes late, and uh, and that your whole life goes like that now. And it's inter interesting to consider that um, you know if sort of an individual, isolated, localized intelligence is calling the shots. It can't take into account all the, the sort of other possible situations going on, all the ramifications and details, and so you know it, it tends to bump into things a lot more, figuratively speaking. Whereas if there's this sort of broader intelligence that's somehow calling the shots, even though you you know might not be consciously be aware that there's going to be you know an accident here, there's some broader intelligence which might take into account all those circumstances, the people driving those cars and, and everything else that's going to happen. And so at least as far as this body is concerned, you know, it's going to sort of steer it in a way that's going to be smoother and, you know, not run into to difficulties that you consciously now, couldn't even foresee. In a way, you know, you're looking at it in a linear way. I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By, I don't think it's linear at all. I just right. think it's all just perfect. Yeah. At the same moment, it's all just perfect. Mm -hmm. So, so again, I think in a way, it's you know we're we're trying to put it into words that the words aren't going to capture it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think it's important, other than the physical suffering that people go through, whether or not. They feel that there's an eye, small eye, right. or whether they have this this experience. I don't. It's still going on by themselves. They may think and have that feeling of the personal eye. I mean, take the the case of uh, Jill Bolt Taylor, Doctor Taylor. Right, she who had, had the stroke. stroke. Right. 
So immediately, and I forget right side, left side, but one side of her brain, mm -hmm. which is the side that had this personal part, was gone. And immediately, she was this. Yeah, I think it was the left side, yeah. Okay. Um, so, but, but it just didn't matter because her life still was going on by itself. Mm -hmm. You just don't know it. What you lose, and what you lose is the suffering. What you gain is this unspeakable peace. And would you say that the suffering is primarily due to this attachment or this grip that you talked about before? The hook? It's the hook and the obsessive thinking. Yeah. All, all suffering is obsessive thinking. We are only trying to quiet our minds. That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we want peace. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we're looking for. You know, nothing else really matters. If you have a peaceful, quiet mind, you can tolerate anything. Yeah. And 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 in a way, I really think, and this is probably a concept that, uh, you know, if you read uh, Eckhart Tolle, he talks about the insanity of the, of the human race. The insanity of the human race is we talk to ourselves constantly. <laughs> yeah, if, that's... And, well, okay. Uh, so how does talking to ourselves constantly result in war and environmental destruction and, uh, you know, s the fact that a child dies of starvation every five seconds? How, how, how are those problems um, a manifestation of our talking to ourselves constantly? Um, I can't answer that because I feel talking to ourselves, con well, so, <laughs> I mean, just, <laughs> this is kind of strange, but, all right, so, so if you're talking to yourself constantly and you're constantly suffering over your thoughts, don't you think you'd be a little pissed off and have less of a tolerance for another person? Mm -hmm. So, you would have less of a tolerance for another religion, mm -hmm. another philosophy, you would feel more apt to have a very strong opinion, willing to fight over it. Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, and you might also perhaps have the sort of the the narrow-mindedness or greediness that would result in, you know, not caring if the product you were selling gave people cancer or, uh, you know, wrecked the environment or so or so on. As long as you you lined your pockets. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's. Um, it's because I mean society has kind of, you know, when you when you I just had a, a, a grandchild two years ago, so I watched her very closely, as you know, I mean it's so beautiful. It's, they're so open and free with the way they see the world, and you know they're not hooked at all. There's no words in there, right. <laughs> which is nice. And and as now she's speaking, and now there's and now there's. There's a, a small ego there. You can you can see it. She wants certain things to be her way. Terrible. This terrible is what news. happens to all. Yeah, terrible twos. So this is what happens to all of us. I mean, we you know we're born into this beautiful world, and it's just a big wonderment. And we just get all this stuff piled on top of us, and we start believing this, and we start believing that. And we start believing that we have to, you know, we have to make a lot of money, and I got to be an important person, and I got to leave something when I die, whatever it is, you know, I want to be president, I want to be this, I want to be that. And, but the truth of the matter is, it's just going on by itself anyway. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting because I mean, what you're saying could cause a person to think all this running by itself business. That if if everyone were like that, we would all just be a bunch of jellyfish floating around, and there wouldn't nothing would get accomplished. There wouldn't be much motivation or an, an incentive or anything. We'd just be sort of, you know, waiting for the universe to kind of flow through us. But um, I would posit that, you know, if everyone in the world were like this, there would actually be a lot more of a constructive nature getting accomplished. And we wouldn't be squandering our energies, um, either personal or, or you know, uh, societal, on fruitless things like yeah. wars. I mean, think how, think how wasteful wars are. You know, how much economically how wasteful they are in terms of and the the, the the lives that are lost and the injuries that are caused and so on. Um, it may sound idealistic, but um, you know. I, it's like if 
you know, if your life is, I mean, you probably personally find you don't get involved in personal squabbles or battles with people. Uh, maybe you used to, I don't know. Uh, but uh, if this lo this intelligence or whatever you want to call it, this, this something or other that, that is guiding your life is also guiding my life and the life, lives of everybody else out there. And so if we're truly all one, and I, and I believe you're living, a, you're living your life from the actual experience of the fact that we're truly all one, then that one is not going to fight against itself. It's, it's going to orchestrate things in such a way that all the parts contribute to a harmonious whole. Uh, sure. Whereas, if the perception is not of that harmonious whole or that oneness that's guiding, that's ultimately fun, foundational to everything, then each part perceives itself as being separate from and very likely at odds with all the other parts. And so every part is out for itself, and we have all these problems, all these clashes, all these divisions. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I would like to suggest that, you know, the type of experience you've been describing tonight is the key to world peace and to to world harmony and to the solution to environmental problems not that we don't have to keep working on those things on their own levels you know you have to do what you need to do to clean up the environment or s resolve political conflicts or, or whatever but if if more of this kind of experience you've been experiencing and describing could be infused into the world into the consciousness of the world if more and more people could wake up to this i suspect that all these you know, problems that seem so intractable, intractable would begin to dissolve. Well, yes, I agree with you, but isn't that what's happening? I it think. is and it isn't. I mean, I, on the one hand, I, I do see, and, every, and others, of course, see uh, an upsurge of this kind of experience. I mean, I wouldn't be able to do this show if, it weren't, if that were not the case. Uh, I have a whole list of people I can talk to who are having this sort of experience. Uh, on the other hand, you know, the world seems to be going to hell in a handbasket. You know, the, the many, many problems seem to be getting worse. I, I'm just listening to an interview today in which someone was saying that it almost seems as though the polarities are increasing. You know, the, the things are getting worse and better at the same time, and we're not quite sure how that's all going to end up. Well, yeah, <laughs> both ends of the spectrum, of the whole, of the yeah. world. <laughs> I'll go back to an analogy, you know, uh, of Maharishi's where... Uh, you know, you can grope around in the in a dark cave, and uh, you can uh, analyze this and bunk into that, and uh, you can do that for a millennia, thousands and thousands of years, and then someone comes in and turns on the light switch, and it all changes instantly. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that's it, it, we're going to get that tipping point happening because. Mm. You know, I mean, I, I went to World Plan things out in, in Fairfield, and, you know, I firmly believe this is it, it's going to happen eventually. Uh, we just have to, I don't know what the numbers are. I can't remember all that stuff. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, but, and, but, and if it is a matter of numbers, I don't think it's solely a, a responsibility of the TM movement to produce those numbers. I think there are people all over the world who are waking not. up each in their own way. Absolutely not. Yeah. The path... There's so many. I mean, this is the beauty of your show. Uh, you know, yet you, you've had people from Fairfield and, mm -hmm. and the meditators and people dedicated to TM. But there's such a diversity of paths that have uh, you know people that you've interviewed, and and there's also such a diversity of how that's expressed in their lives too. I mean, you have these you know basic experience, but I express it differently. I mean, the young fellow last week. Uh, He's got a beautiful website, and he's doing, you know, people are really, really trying to understand. I think he's helping. I taught satsang for a while in prisons, actually, and it was a yeah. very beautiful experience. So much love. You know, we all do. There in New Jersey? Do. Uh, no, actually up in Boston. Huh. Have a good, uh, there's a really good sangha up in Boston. I got involved with them. What so kind of a sangha? You mean a Buddhist thing? or? Oh, no, no. When I say sangha, I mean uh, people uh, oh. that uh, just go to all these teachers that come through. Uh, Ilham was very popular at one time. She, right. she got um, sick and she couldn't travel anymore, but uh -huh. uh, 
There's a lot of teachers that go through Boston. Uh, so, so you just were sort of hanging out with that crowd, seeing teachers, and and you know had a bunch of friends, and and then you uh, you started yes. actually going into prisons I, I, and talking to the prisoners. What would you say to them? Oh, I'd have given the experience. I you describe them. your experience. Uh, you no, I teach them uh, a, a sort of a meditation that I kind of came up with. Mm -hmm. It's really, uh, it, you know, the body is is a gateway. To this experience. So what I would do is I would uh, take them through a guided meditation and basically show them that awareness is unconditional. Awareness is going on by itself. It's floating. You know, I have them just feel parts of their body, suggest this, maybe a sound or whatever, and then immediately they would, in prison, they would get have a small awakening. Yeah. I remember one guy <laughs> this was a guy, if you saw him coming down the street, you would definitely cross the street. Mm -hmm. You didn't want to be on the same side of the street with this guy. And he sat down, and he was jumping around, jittery and stuff, and we went through this guy to meditation. And when I opened my eyes and I looked at him, his face was just glowing. Mm -hmm. All the stress was gone. Mm -hmm. He came over and shook my hand and says, that's the best medicine I've ever had. Wow. So he had it. You know, he got it. And And... This is another thing. I don't feel I did anything. I don't feel it was because of me. All he did was remember who he was. Yeah. And that's it. With all these teachers, another point I'd like to make, you can't put people up on a pedestal. They're just, we're all the same. We're all the same. And when you are sitting in satsang or with a teacher and you're feeling that expansion, it's you. This is who you are. It's not because of the teacher. It's not, you're not feeling the teacher's presence. You're feeling your presence. Yeah. I think sometimes teachers have the, a knack of acting as a catalyst, you know, and uh, I forget the exact scientific definition of a catalyst, but it's something which sort of facilitates a, uh, a, a chemical reaction without... Uh, without actually sort of influencing the the reaction. It's sort of just in, in the presence of the catalyst, the reaction takes place more readily. Exactly. And I think that's what you could sort of say of a, of a teacher who, uh, they're not giving you anything. It's not like there's a transmission from A to B, but they're somehow they're, they're able to create a space in which it's more con conducive for you to recognize who you are. Exactly. When you sit in, in satsang with, I mean, the whole group, everybody wants to remember themselves. Right. And the teacher is, you know, pointing with, with his or her fingers uh -huh. towards this and yeah. talking to you about this. And, of course, you're settling down and it's you just remember. You and you just, created an opportunity also. I mean, those guys in the prison aren't just going to get together and sit and close their eyes and, ha and have this thing happen, but you've created a circumstance, you know, where, you're, where it can be allowed to happen, and you're just kind of like guiding them through it and letting it, you know, mm -hmm. happen in a more directed yeah. way. Yeah, uh, you know, exactly, exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Do you still have any uh, motivation to do that? Uh, not too much now. We... Um, we spend six months in Florida mm. uh, during the winter, and we spend six months here. Now, this year, when I go to Florida, uh, I'm going to teach a meditation class, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a bit, it's a resort that we go to. We have a motorhome, mm -hmm. so it's a, a it's more mm -hmm. or less a little more fancy campground than yeah. you know, than a KOA. And there, there's a community there. There's like 600 people. Most of the people have been there multiple years in a row, so everybody's very friendly. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of activities. So this year, I'm, I'm doing the meditation. I teach a photography and um, a digital photography course mm -hmm. along with the computer. I do a lot of cooking for the parties and uh, aerobic walking in the morning. Nice. So, uh, yeah, that's my, you know, that's my activity. <laughs> and what do you do when you're up in New Jersey? Hang out. <laughs> <laughs> ah, to be retired. Yeah. Uh, I don't know well, when Yankees, I'll be. The Yankees have had uh, senior senior days. You can get uh, seventy dollars seats for five bucks. Cool. So really nice, right down the five pole line, and uh, ah. you know, it's great first base or or the third base so, side. So you're going to a bunch of Yankees games. 
went to quite a few this year. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's it's so funny, you know. I mean, it's such a conundrum, such a paradox. You know, here's this guy who says, uh, you know, there's nobody home, there's no individuality, but I love to go to Yankees games. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and the, you know, still you still watch television, which is amazing sometimes. <laughs> I'm <doing. laughs> yeah. you know, staring at this screen, and you know, some of the shows are good, some aren't. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of teachers who who kind of harp on this nobody home business, you know, the no individuality. Douglas Harding was one, uh, yeah. you know, Tony Parsons, and and the, there's a whole Neil Advaita crowd, and but a lot of them sort of jump to a lot of conclusions from it you know okay well since there's nobody home that means there's no in, there's no reincarnation there's no god you know all these concepts that people have come up with are are you know, just uh, silly notions that they use to entertain themselves and um you know from I, I don't claim to have your level of experience but i suspect that when i do i will still acknowledge this the reality or the significance of all the all the the levels and stages of uh, experience and development that anyone may have. I mean, would you, would you agree? I mean, oh, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, um, Neo Advaita mm -hmm. uh, uh, tends to uh, tends to emphasize that that stillness and that 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 experience, and really doesn't talk about what happens afterwards. Yeah, uh, maybe it and, hasn't happened afterwards for the people who are talking about it, you know, and maybe they're, I don't know, maybe they're keeping themselves stuck at that stage by, by dwelling on it so adamantly. I, I'm, I just wonder. Well, you know, when you, when you talk um, to the general public, mm -hmm. really can't, you know, feel what's, where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. So what you really want to do is give them that experience, however it happens, just from sitting in a group, or you want to uh, have them have that uh, uh, that spaciousness while they're in satsang, right. and sometimes that lasts a few days, and then you know, then everybody says, "Oh, my mind came back." I mean, yeah. that's where you get this hook about you, you're going to stop thinking because while you're in satsang, you're really not thinking too much. Yeah. You're just yeah. grooving on the on the uh, on the silence. But so I think that's why that's emphasized with these people, huh. uh, the teachers. But, but don't you think it sort of uh, don't you think it sort of misleads people to give them the impression that that's the end of it? It definitely could be confusing. It yeah. definitely could be confusing, uh, and I was confused for a long time. And even if the teacher said, you know, thoughts are, I still it it um, it's still confused. It's the it's that experience that that does away with the confusion. Yeah, uh, and, and you're a guy who meditated for 30-odd years you know, in order to have that experience. I mean, a lot of these people dismiss the value of meditation, too. They say, you don't need it, it's a lot of bunk. You don't need teachers, they're a lot of bunk, even though they're being a teacher. And, and you know, you should just realize it. Bingo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Or, or just stop. Stop. Yeah. Just, I can't stop. And, and unfortunately, I think what a lot of people do when they hear that is that they glom on to a, an intellectual concept of the world being an illusion and the self not existing and so on and so forth. And they, they feel like, okay, well, I've got the concept. That must be it. In fact, I was listening to, to one person who is very involved in one of these interview shows, which has this flavor strongly. And one day she said, you know, but it's all so ordinary. And there was this wistfulness in her voice, like, isn't there anything more than this? I mean... You know, this is this all the, the this, is this the, what all the fuss is about? What I'm experiencing because it doesn't seem like, it, you know, that, that was the impression she was giving, and um, it's unfortunate. I just I just feel there's this, there's this sort of misleading thing that goes on. Mm. I, this is true, but you can go through a period where life is very flat. Yeah, especially in the witnessing stage where where there's still somebody watching. Yeah, it, life can be very unpleasant during that time hmm. uh, and that was that eight to twelve years that I went through but um, yeah uh, oh, Do you I feel that you went through a dark night of the soul period or might it, that might that have been it I could I guess you could call it that you know I yeah. I, I'm not I mean sure. I was listening to Andrew Harvey yesterday um, I don't know if you're familiar with him but he's he's a he's a very articulate brilliant guy I love to listen to him he's written about 25 books I was listening to him on on sounds true insights at the edge interview and he was saying that basically 
anybody who hasn't gone through what he describes as this really gut-wrenching, agonizing, dark night of the soul thing, really, the pits, isn't enlightened or isn't awakened. They're, they're, they're kidding themselves. And, you know, I, I, I take exception with that just because I've seen exceptions, so many of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mine wasn't gut wrenching. It was just kind of boring and uh, and uh, like I say, very flat. There was no mm -hmm. bliss. Very little bit of um, what I would call happiness going on. And uh, you know, and then the, yeah, yeah. I, it's definitely different for everybody. It is. There is no set way that this is going to happen. I think it depends to a certain extent on how much garbage you've managed to clear out, you know, through whatever practice you have done. I mean, some people come upon these awakenings quite unexpectedly, um, and, you know, and then all this stuff has to get worked out, you know, be, to, to kind of bring their, their, in, their being into, into line or into accord with the, the awakening they've had. And since they haven't, you know, been chipping away at it bit by bit, it has to sort of be, you know, taken out in bucket loads, uh, and it can be very, very unpleasant. But, exactly. you know, I mean, you started meditating in your 20s and, and stuck to it, and I, you know, I think you probably cleared the path to a great extent in preparation for this awakening. I, well, I, I, have, I have to agree, and if you read uh, Ramana Maharishi, he talks about the different types of of uh, uh, disciples and where they might be at, and where certain things that's what that person has to do, uh, devotion or, or meditation or just inquiry or whatever it might be. And, you know, we all start from a certain point, whether there is past lives or, you know, uh, or whether it's just the energies that gather when this physical mind-body is, you know, is created, comes into existence, uh, whatever that might be, or even, you know, the DNA that that stretches back millions of years through all the incarnations of consciousness <laughs> whatever all this might be whatever it is whatever it is i forgot my point <laughs> well, i think your point is you're saying different strokes for different folks it's just, just that uh you know be, yeah. the attempts to sort of say that it has to be a particular way are too rigid and it and obviously you know if we look at the creation itself it doesn't seem to be the way God operates, if we want to speak in terms of God, I mean, he loves diversity, yeah. you know, exactly. Un unbelievably uh, Diverse, creative, creative and, diversity. And changing constantly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Alrighty, well, yeah. um, I'm at that point in the interview. I always ask if there's anything that I haven't asked that you think you might like to say that we haven't touched upon. Well, I'd like to recommend something. Sure. To uh, anyone who who is experiencing what's going on here, uh, there's a great book that I just read, and I haven't read a book in. Many, in fact, I gave my whole spiritual library away. <laughs> oh, maybe four or five years ago. But uh, the the Adyashanti book. Uh, oh yeah, the end your, of your world. Man, awesome book. Oh god. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, let's let's repeat that. In fact, I have a link to that book on uh, batgap dot com. Uh, I have it linked right to the Amazon page so in the right hand column. If you scroll down a ways, you see it. Yeah. Uh, it's Adyashanti, the end of your world. And uh, it's written for people who've already awakened, basically, and uh, it discusses all the sort of trials and tribulations that you might still go through <laughs> after, exactly. after having had an awakening. And I gotta say, he's the most honest teacher I've come across. I know, I love I'm the not guy. I thought about, you know, Maharishi, but uh, well, he's I mean, just Maharishi. down to earth, direct, simple. absolutely, and says it exactly the way it happened to him without any. Reservation. I mean, he's just telling the truth, yeah. and I give him credit for that. Chris. So. And I might add that I mean, if you go to adyashanti.org, you can. Uh, there's a lot of audios you can download, and they have. He he most went well, about twice a month. He does a live um, phone call thing, which you can listen uh, listen to through the internet. Actually, it's a live internet broadcast, uh, which you can do in audio or video, and. Um, it's free in audio. It costs ten bucks in video, but you can call in and ask him questions and stuff. He's coming to Fairfield next year. You ought to come out and visit when he comes. 
Yeah, yeah. I uh, well, I love Fairfield. It's just I haven't been, uh, you know, going away for six months in the winter and then coming home. It takes you a month to get the house back operating yeah. properly. Plant your garden, you know, and then you mm-hmm. wait for your tomatoes. And uh, <laughs> yeah, no, he's, he's coming next April. Anyway, that's a great book, The End of Your World. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's about it. Uh, All right. Well, great. This has been a this has been fun, Joel. Um, Thank you. We'll, if anything significant ever changes for you, we'll do another one. <laughs> right. Start seeing angels or something, you know? Yeah, I'll let you know. <laughs> Thanks yeah. so much. It was a, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Um, don't hang up yet. I just want to uh, conclude, and, and then afterwards, after I stop the recording, we'll talk for a bit. But um, uh, you've been listening to or watching Buddha at the Gas Pump, uh, episode number 36, I think. Uh, my name is Rick Archer, and I've been talking with Joel Rumbelow, uh, who lives in uh, northwestern New Jersey, and uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Next week, I keep saying this every week, but next week it really sounds like we're going to have this Richard Shooping fellow who has had, had today. I was going to have him tonight, but he had dental work. Um, speaking of dental work, and uh, he didn't know if, what kind of shape he'd be in tonight, so uh, we we'll put him off till next week. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.